And I want to say right from the start, this is a bit of a personal indulgence for me. I have populated this PowerPoint presentation with pictures of some of my favorite houses from around the country and even Canada. A lot of the houses I've had personal experience with and two of them I have even owned. So this is for me as much as it is for you. So here we go with architecture of the Beardsley houses, 1832 to 1937. A couple of things I want to point out in the beginning. Uh, the houses in this uh, talk are presented in the order of their styles heyday as opposed to the construction date of the house itself. Uh, traits from one style of architecture often influence the succeeding style. Uh, particularly from the Italianate to the French Second Empire, both of which strongly influenced the Queen Anne style. Uh, also, it's important to note that not all of the rules apply to all houses. Uh, there are certain general features that define each style, but not every house in that style is going to have every feature. And I've tried to include uh, simple examples as well as more elaborate examples, and those styles often depended on a number of things, including individual taste as well as financial reserves. Uh, generally speaking, the more money you had, the more elaborate your house was. It's also interesting to note that the Beardsley houses that I'm sampling here, and there are seven of them, tend to be on the more conservative side of their general styles, even Ruthmere. And you'll see what I mean as we go through. And we're going to lead off with a bit of an anachronism. The oldest style is represented by the youngest house. Uh, the colonial style was popular from 1630 to 1780. And here we have a colonial revival at 2233 Greenleaf Boulevard here in Elkhart, built in 1937. Uh, this uh, house was called Hubble House after Andrew Hubble Beardsley. It was the home of Walter and Marjorie Beardsley from 1937 until Marjorie's death in 1992. And this was also Robert Beardsley's first home in Elkhart upon his adoption. Walter died in 1980, Marjorie in 1992, at which time Robert inherited the house, and he sold it off in 1995. Now, in his book, Robert Recalls, Robert describes this house as Georgian architecture. Colonial and Georgian are interchangeable terms, depending on where the house lives. It was built, if it was built in King George III's England, it's Georgian. If it was built in the colonies, it's colonial. But basically, they're one and the same. And I might as well throw in a quick note about the federal style, which uh, may come up in your minds. Almost identical to the colonial style, with a few very subtle differences, Federal style is strictly American and incorporates things such as carved wooden eagles or stars, distinctly American uh, features carved into the woodwork and such, usually over a front door. That is really the only difference between the federal and the colonial. Here are some prime examples of both the colonial and the colonial revival. Uh, the original colonial period ran, as I said, from approximately 1630 to 1780, and all dates are approximate, of course, versus the colonial revival from 1880 to 1960. And I've got examples of both. Up in the left-hand corner, we have the Samuel Lincoln House from Hingham, Massachusetts, 1649, a wood frame house with a very kind of boxy geometrical style and very similar uh, symmetrical floor pattern with a simple entryway and, oops, wrong. <laughs> Where are we here? Simple entryway there versus the Shirley Plantation of Hopewell, Virginia, uh, completed in 1738 with a very elaborate Greek-influenced front portico with a two-level porch, a symmetrical five-bay design, pitched roof, twin chimneys, which are all very characteristic of the colonial style. A more recent version, a colonial revival, the Wilson Wilbert Wilt House right here in Elkhart uh, from 1903. You may recognize that. It's one block down the street from here. That's my house. <laughs> and here we have a colonial revival from 1925 in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Traits do carry over from the old to the new. The 
portico carries over from the 1700s into the 1900s. The simple doorway carries all the way back. And again, you've got the same five bay uh, symmetrical design. But again, as I said, not every rule applies. For instance, this one is far from symmetrical. What makes a colonial a colonial? Steeply pitched roofs seen here in the Van Allen House of Kinderhook, New York from 1737. Tall brick chimneys often in pairs, or in this case, three. Elaborate entryways such as this house from Palo Alto, California, circa 1920. And double hung windows with small panes, in this case, nine over nine. Here we move into the Greek Revival style. It's a bit of a radical departure, but there are still some similarities. I did it again. Uh, I still have the Greek influence portico. Uh, the Greek Revival style flourished from 1825 to about 1860 and is exemplified here by 226 East Beardsley Avenue here in Elkhart, built in 1905, raised in 1962 to make room for the church parking lot where you've all parked your cars today. <laughs> I know, isn't it sad? <laughs> the house was built by Andrew Hubble Hubbeardsley in 1905. And for those who are not familiar with the history of Miles Laboratories, Hub spearheaded the research team behind Alka-Seltzer circa 1931. And Robert Beardsley spent much of his early years in this house. And as I said, it was torn down in 1962. The Greek Revival runs from one extreme to the other. Very simple designs such as the, this house in Salem, Massachusetts, circa 1840. Uh, very basic design. Uh, but the one thing you're gonna see almost every time is that full triangular pediment. Very similar to another Greek Revival house, this one in Valley Falls, New York, also circa 1840. Same three bay construction with the offset front door and that shallow pedestal. Up here, the pedestal at least continues, but here we have again a full Greek entablature with ionic columns. This is Esperanza in Branchport, New York, circa 1838. And I know this house quite well. It served over its lifetime as a private home, an art gallery, a winery, and now it's a bed and breakfast. And I know this house so well because my uncle actually thought of buying it at one point. And here we take it to the extreme Dunleaf in Natchez, Mississippi, circa 1855. It's now a bed and breakfast. I had the pleasure of spending a night there once. And you can see it is surrounded on all four sides by columns. That is taking the Greek temple design to its maximum. And in fact, Dunleaf is the only remaining existing example of a plantation house complete sur completely surrounded by columns in the state of Louisiana, or Mississippi rather. Yes. Um, yes. The Khan Mansion on Strong, is that a Greek revival? Or Basically a Greek revival, yes. What are the traits of the Greek revival? The most common are the pillars on the front. Three main orders of Greek columns include the Doric with a very simple square capital, the Ionic with a scrolled capital, and the Corinthian with a very ornate uh, acanthus leaf design, which you can see here, supporting a very heavy uh, ornate entablature on the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C., completed in 1935. Now, why are Greek revivals so often painted white? As you can see here in Maidwood in Napoleonville, Louisiana from 1846, well, the, the answer to that is pretty obvious to me at least. These houses were designed to emulate Greek temples, which were often made out of white marble. So the white paint is a cheap way of simulating that marble effect. Also, again, you have the prominent portico with an attic window or a fan light, which gave both light and ventilation to the attic, making that an actual usable space instead of just a storage area. Very largely, yes, so, but that also has a lot of federal influence in it. Obviously, for the a U.S. executive mansion, the federal style would have been a prominent first choice. Now we move to another radical departure, the Gothic Revival, uh, 1830 to 1860. 
as emphasized here by Buck Moon Farm in Bristol, Indiana, built in 1832. Uh, the house, the original portion was built in 1832, but it was much expanded over the years. Robert Beardsley purchased the house on July 17, 1958, and he nicknamed it Buck Moon, which is the Iroquois name for the July full moon in reference to that purchase date. He sold the house in 2004, and it's uh, still a private home today. What is the point of Gothic Revival? Well, it's all about points. As you can see in the Bowen House of Woodstock, Connecticut from 1846, there's points everywhere. Uh, pierced dormer windows uh, stabbing their way through the roof line, pointed arches and doorways. Taking it to the absolute extreme, at least for American standards, Lyndhurst, the Jay Gould estate of Terrytown, New York, completed in 1838, is literally a British castle rebuilt in America. Uh, Gothic in the extreme. I've never been there, but it would be on my dream places to visit. Uh, Afton Villa in St. Francisville, Louisiana, 1849, where I'll be in October, uh, actually takes the, adds a little twist to this. As you can see, the points actually go downward on this one to counteract the upward points. And of course, this one we probably all recognize, St. John the Evangelist Church right here in Elkhart, completed in 1895. Uh, now that is well outside the popular time for the Gothic Revival style, but churches and civic buildings tended to cling to those older styles well after their heyday as private homes. <laughs> Some of the Gothic Revival features, the ornate gingerbread key, uh, barge boards and very steep gables, elaborate window tracery, often with stained glass, and OG or pointed windows and doors. Next, we come to the Italianate style, uh, popularized from 1840 to 1880, as exemplified by the Havilah Beardsley House here in Elkhart. Uh, originally built in 1848 and redesigned almost entirely in 1874. Uh, the central block was built in 1848 by Havila and Rachel Beardsley. It is the oldest brick house in Elkhart, again for those who don't know the history. Uh, it was redesigned in 1874 by James Rufus Beardsley, their son, sold out of the Beardsley family in 1913 and acquired by the Ruthmere Foundation in 2007. Some interesting examples of the Italianate style include Clover Lawn in Bloomington, Illinois, Bloomington, Illinois from 1872, the Bonin House in Vandalia, Michigan, circa 1845, one of my favorite local examples, Siena in White Pigeon, Michigan uh, from 1876, that was my first house, and the James Cole House of Hartford, Connecticut from 1855. <coughs> And one thing that stands out on all four of these examples, even though it may not be completely obvious, is the tower. The tower, the tower, the tower. Uh, beginning with the Italianate, there is an emphasis growing in height over width. And again, more elaborate exterior detailing. Uh, how can you tell Italian from French? It's all in the dressing. <coughs> Heavy cornice brackets, uh, which if you go down to the Havila Beardsley house, they're pretty obvious down there. Wrought iron roof decorations are very popular, and that actually harks back to the Gothic revival a little bit. Tall arched windows, as seen here in the Pickens County Courthouse from Carrollton, Alabama, 1878. And again, you'll see those at the Havila Beardsley house as well. And on top of almost every Italianate, you have a roomy square belvedere. I want to talk a little bit about the difference between a belvedere and a cupola because there is a difference. A belvedere is always square, is large enough to serve as a small room, and was intended for extended use for hours at a time, a place where you could put furniture and still have a lofty view. A cupola, on the other hand, is quite small, usually octagonal, not meant for extended use. It's merely an overlook. You're not going to have a party up there or anything because you're not going to get more than two people in a good-sized cupola at any given time. <coughs> Here we come to the French Second Empire style, 1860 to 1880, as... 
Okay. Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So the helm of your doesn't have the tower feature? No, it doesn't. Okay, but again, as I said early on, not all rules apply to all houses. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy. <laughs> yes. Oh, the handle of the Beardsley house originally, was it more of a federal style or something until they changed it to the Italian name? I always thought of it as originally more a very simple Greek revival. Oh. But uh, yeah, uh, James Rufus completely Italianized it. Now the French Second Empire in this talk is exemplified by the Davenport Mansion, uh, circa 1870, raised circa 1900 uh, here in Elkhart, and that was located directly across the street from the Havila Beardsley House. Uh, built circa 1870 for Benjamin and Sarah Davenport. Sarah was the only surviving daughter of Havila and Rachel. It was located directly across from Main Street um, from the Havila House, where the Floyd Best Mansion from 1941 is currently standing. That's that long, white-painted French chateau-style house. And it was torn down around 1900 to make room for the mansion that stood between this one and the Floyd Best House. <laughs> yeah, I agree, because um, to be honest, the Second Empire is my favorite style. So I never got to see the uh, Davenport house. Obviously, it was torn down 68 years before I was even born, but I miss it nonetheless. <laughs> uh, some beautiful examples of the Second Empire style start with the Culberson Mansion in New Albany, Indiana from 1867. Uh, the Raymond House in Malcolm, Iowa, 1874, a house that I almost bought at one point. Majerus House in St. Cloud, Minnesota from 1891. And down here, Villa Mar in Little Rock, Arkansas from 1881. And a lot of you might recognize that as Julia Sugarbaker's house from the TV show Designing Women. <laughs> yeah, I knew that would get your attention. <laughs> Now, are my eyes playing tricks on me? No matter where you look, there's curves, there's movement, there's kinetic energy in every Italianate house, or French Second Empire house, and indeed going on into the Queen Anne, as we'll see. Uh, the most popular and most distinctive trait of the French Second Empire house is the concave mansard roof. But that, again, is by no means the only distinguishing feature. Here we have a very tall central tower with a convex mansard roof. A mansard is simply a double-pitched roof. And here, beautifully, the convex balances the concave, giving it a very nice sinewy quality. Round oriel windows with heavy ornate corbels are not uncommon. And an asymmetrical uh, massing is very popular as in this example from Mount Kisco, New York, circa 1880. And again, there's an emphasis on height. Towers everywhere, always with that dominating little room at the top to overlook the kingdom, as it were. <laughs> so Mark, that's a lot like the Bates Motel. <laughs> yes, actually. I actually looked that one up as a possible feature to include in here. <laughs> That brings us to the Queen Anne style, 1880 to 1910, roughly speaking, uh, which draws heavily on, again, the Greek Revival, the Italianate, and the French Second Empire, particularly the last two. And here we have the Hartley Lord Mansion, nicknamed Sunnyside, in Kennebunk, Kennebunk Maine from 1886. Uh, it was built by Hartley Lord, 1825 to 1912, between 1884 and 86. Lord was a Kennebunk native and a Boston businessman. The house was designed by George Meacham, the designer of the Boston Public Garden in 1859, and the house was acquired by Robert Beardsley in 1981. He nicknamed it Sunnyside, and he owned it until 2005. Some of my favorite examples of the Queen Anne, here we actually start with what you might consider a simple Queen Anne by comparison in Denver, Colorado, circa 1887. And even here you see there's still quite a lot of elaborate woodwork going on, even with an, some, a design suggesting a Chinese Chippendale almost. And there are much simpler uh, examples of Queen Anne architecture throughout the United States, but one of the points of the Queen Anne was to exaggerate that detail. And so even in a simple one like this one, 
you're getting, you're pushing the limits here. One of my favorite houses in the entire country is the Bigelow House in Findlay, Ohio, circa 1888. Massive, tall, proud, but at the same time understated. Uh, it's beautifully painted, but the colors are muted, and it's not screaming for attention, but it gets that attention nonetheless. On the other hand, you have the Masonic Temple of Mount Dora, Florida from 1893. And here you can see Gothic influences in the pointed arches, uh, metal, metal uh, grill work on top, and very elaborate barge boards all around the porch. Again, that lofty tower reaching for the sky. Taken one step further in the detailing here is the Carson Mansion from Eureka, California, 1886. And here the external decoration is just starting to get to the point where it's almost too much to bear. <laughs> but what was it that um, Christopher Walken said on Saturday Night Live? More cowbell. <laughs> when is enough enough? Uh, here we have some very over-the-top detailing in the Winchester Mystery House, San Jose, California, built continuously from 1886 to 1922. Fish scale, uh, so, what's the shingles decorating the entire exterior. Uh, here you even have some external woodwork rep reminiscent of the Elizabethan style of 16th century England and a free floating oriel window complete with a balcony on top. That is just extreme in the extreme. Uh, some of the other traits a round multi-story tower is almost always there, usually topped by a conical roof. And the wraparound porch is not dissimilar to the attached gazebo that you see over here. And again, elaborate woodwork, heavy cornices drawing on the influence of not only the Gothic, but the Italianate as well. Which brings us to our final style. The Beaux Arts, 1890 to 1920. Some of you might recognize this house. A few might even visit it from time to time. Uh, this, of course, is our own beloved Ruth Mir, completed in 1910. It was built for Albert A.R. and Elizabeth Beardsley between 1908 and 1910, designed by Enoch Hill Turnock, an English-born Elkhart raised architect, inspired by the Beaux Arts architecture at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. Beaux Arts uh, means fine arts in French. And the house was named Ruth Muir after A.R. and Elizabeth's daughter Ruth, who died in 1881 at the age of eight months. It was sold out of the Beardsley family in 1945 and then acquired by the Beardsley Foundation in 1967, opened as a museum in 1973 on Robert Beardsley's 40th birthday. Quite a birthday present he gave himself. <laughs> Some prominent examples of the Beaux Arts style, which seems to have been especially popular in New York State. Here we have the Doralton Apartments from Manhattan, New York, 1902. The New York City Public Library, also in Manhattan from 1902. And the City Hall of Oswego, New York from 1906. And here, just to, for a little bit of contrast, we have a bas relief uh, known as Defense, located on the Disable Bridge, Michigan Avenue in Chicago, Illinois, from 1928. Again, you can see that emphasis on height. Yeah. Yeah. On the top, it has a lot of, looks like our hotel here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that one? Yeah, so um, yeah, I don't think ours comes even close to comparing to that in terms of the... <laughs> Yeah, but uh, here the detailing, again, is just over the top. <laughs> no pun intended. To coin a phrase, or coin, depending on how you want to pronounce it, one of the most prominent features of the Beaux Arts style are dressed stone or ashlar coins uh, decorating the corners of nearly every building, including our own Ruth Mir here. Uh, there is a heavy emphasis on the external texture, uh, surfaces, 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 richly detailed. Um, how many of you have actually stood outside Ruth Muir and really taken in the features of this house? Okay, for those of you who haven't, I encourage you to do so as you leave here today. You will see things, I guarantee, even those of you that have looked at it will probably see things you never noticed before. 
And uh, again, Ruthmere is a little bit understated compared to a lot of the other uh, houses of the same style. Here we have an extremely elaborate uh, projecting window on this apartment building from Manhattan, New York. And again, there's this tremendous emphasis on height over width as seen in the Ferguson Mansion of Louisville, Kentucky from 1905. And I don't know if there's any truth to this or not, but I remember uh, during my training, Jennifer telling me that the third floor of Ruthmere, Albert added that to the design merely to make the house look taller from the street. So again, there's that height kicking in. To wrap up once more, we do have seven different styles of architecture uh, across the top row, the colonial and colonial revival, the Italianate, the Greek rev uh, Gothic revival, down in the lower left-hand corner, the Italianate, I'm sorry, okay, starting over, <laughs> colonial revival, Greek revival, Gothic revival, Italianate, French Second Empire, Queen Anne, and in the middle, the French Beaux Arts. And if you look closely, you can see how some of the styles begin to influence their predecessors. So with that, I would like to open the floor for any additional questions. Just yeah, three. Just to get right, is that uh, the, um, is there any access to, or anything up there? On the roof? Well, yeah, oh. <laughs> uh, there is roof access, and those are the chimneys I think you're talking about there. Uh, there is roof access. It's not a flat roof, though. It is slightly pitched, so it's not useful if you want to have a rooftop party. Every, all your guests are going to be sliding off. <laughs> Dree. Again, it's not, it's not a flat roof. Well, I mean, yeah. no arches, no... Um, oh, no steep gables yes. and such? Yeah, it is it's kind of understated. In this case, it's the uh, surrounding parapet that is meant to stand out mm -hmm. versus the roof itself. Now, architecturally speaking, flat roofs are not a good idea because what do they do? Especially in rainy, snowy climates, they collect that water and they start to leak. <laughs> To leak? No. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, that pitch is meant to shed the water. Yes? So when I went to the Frank Lloyd Wright house that he did of his own um, in Oak Park, and he was right next to what we would all call like a Victorian, but maybe it was more Queen Anne, you know, with mm -hmm. a lot of the detail and all the little, the colors, is that true? Would that be Queen Anne when they put all those different Yes, as a matter of fact, that is a very special category known as a painted lady. Oh. And painted lady is defined as a house, most often a Queen Anne, with three or more contrasting colors oh. in the paint scheme. Wow. Yes, yeah. Milwaukee, where I lived for many years, has a lot of painted ladies in it as well. I think of the ones up on the, what is it, Mackinac Island? Mm -hmm. But so was that kind of... It, it, the more modernist type of homes that he started to develop, I think they were a reaction to maybe the over the Yeah, uh, Wright emphasized a lot of straight lines and horizontal versus the vertical, whereas the Queen Anne and its uh, related styles are again that upward thrust toward the sky. He yes. hated them. I mean, <laughs> I'm not surprised. A that close to one that he was building and he had it torn down. Mm. I can't agree with that personally. <laughs> yes. Just out of curiosity, did, we have different styles of architecture. Did you find that there are specific architects that only do particular styles of architecture? Well, most of the architects were probably designing what was popular at the time. So they would have emphasized or focused on what was popular. But uh, as anybody that lives in Elkhart and has studied architecture knows, Turnock himself did not focus strictly on the Beaux Arts style. In fact, Ruth Mirror is quite unique in that respect for Turnock. Mm -hmm. Visit his building in Chicago if you have a chance. The, uh, it was the Golden Palace, now it's called the Brewster Apartments. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful location and beautiful building. 
What a part, can you? The uh, Brewster. Brewster, okay. Yeah. Dory, did you have another question? Um, yes, I did. <laughs> I would call that Queen Anne, very, very definitely Queen Anne. Uh, the one difference between that and uh, any of the houses that I showed in here is that one is largely built out of stone, uh, which would have been a sign of extreme wealth. Stone was very, very expensive. To build a foundation out of stone was one thing. To build an entire house out of it, you had to have the big bucks for that. I'm not even, I hate to admit it, but I've never even seen a picture of it as far as I know, so. Mm. Probably, um, it was of the time period of Queen Anne when that was the most dominant style. Yes? Is that true Studebaker as well as the Oliver Nation? The Studebaker, you said? Yeah. Yeah, it's the Kopschel home. That's all the same. Yeah. Well, Studebaker is the one with Tippecanoe Place. That's different. Yeah, no. that? Again, I believe that is a Queen Anne. Um, I, really stone and, mm -hmm. okay. But again, that shows the wealth. Yeah. I, even if you think about castles in medieval Europe, the earliest castles were built out of wood. Stone was too expensive. <laughs> so uh, stone construction only came along with the more wealthy uh, lords that could afford it. Yes. In addition to the 226 here, do you have any pictures uh, or descriptions of the other homes that were in that block or the, and or the uh, home that preceded the best, it was in between the two? Mm, yeah, um, yeah, there was only one other house that was torn down uh, to make room for the church. Um, the Floyd Best Mansion was constructed on the site of Linmore, which was a large Greek revival, and that replaced the Davenport Mansion. And I have seen a picture of Linmore. I thought of including it in here, but uh, found examples, other ones that I like better. Kind of dark, wasn't it? From the pictures I've seen, yeah, it was rather a dark exterior. And there was one Yeah, that one uh, Robert talked about in his book, he tore that one down himself because by the time he acquired Ruth Mir or the foundation acquired Ruth Mir, that house was too far gone to save. Dale? Just a fast question. Each of these styles, we looked at exteriors. Were there any particular interior things that each of those styles had? Not necessarily. Interiors were very much up to the taste of the homeowner and you could do anything you wanted. Uh, the exterior is what you presented to the public, so you had to be at least somewhat in keeping with public taste or risk having your house ransacked and burned by angry neighbors. Um, but once you get inside that front door, let your imagination run riot. Do whatever you want. So you can't judge a book by its cover. Very true, <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, any more questions? Great presentation. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you.